Uh, well, good morning. Uh, my name is James McGregor, uh, and I'm the publisher of the Silicon Valley Business Journal. And on behalf of our title sponsor, the San Jose Earthquakes, and our partner sponsors, DevCon Construction, and our public transportation partner, VTA, I'd like to welcome you to our uh, first Silicon Valley Sports Summit and After Party. So I want to begin by asking uh, all of you uh, a question. How many of you believe that uh, timing, timing and the ability to improvise plays an important part in the success of any business? Every hand goes up. You know, when we started planning this event several months ago, we wanted to make sure that we had something for everyone. That included having an outstanding opening speaker, having panel discussions with industry leaders, ex-players that would be able to talk about success on and off the field, and of course, a great party. Then, in the last week, if you've been reading the Business Journal, and I know each of you have been, um, a few things happened in the business of sports. Uh, some folks changed jobs, <clears throat> a lawsuit was filed, uh, and new sponsorship deals were announced, making the timing of this event ideal. And due to some of those changes, we have updated our speaker lineup, updated our speaker lineup, so that you and our readers of our July 12th sports business special issue will get the very, very latest information on who and what is impacting the business of sports here in Silicon Valley. Now, this morning, we have a full lineup with a ton of content. First, we'll hear from the Commissioner of Major League Soccer, Don Garber. Following our opening session with him, we will move into our, panel, our two panel discussions this morning. Our sessions will look at the impact of sports and stadiums, and there's a pretty big project going on across the street, uh, on the local economy. And then how technology, how technology is changing the fan experience. Our final session this morning will be a question and answer session with former San Jose Shark Dave Maley and 49er great Dwight Clark. Along the way, we will be giving you video updates on all of the professional teams that either play or should be playing, like the Oakland A's, for example. Now, I'd like to invite Dave Cavill, president of the San Jose Earthquakes, to give an update on the earthquakes and introduce our first speaker, MLS Commissioner Don Garber. Dave. Well, first of all, I want to start with a little story. So um, how many folks here went and saw the old earthquakes play in the 1970s? Do we have anyone? Yes. How many folks have seen us play at Spartan Stadium? Dan Quartermarsh, you didn't see us play? Yeah. Yeah, so Spartan Stadium. How about at Buckshaw Stadium? And now, who is excited about seeing us in our new stadium? Awesome. Awesome. So, obviously, we are very excited to be, have a new stadium on the way. I think we have some photos we are going to put up of the new stadium. I want to kind of walk people through. Here is our new home. Um, has anyone been over to the site and seen it? Yes. Who was involved in the world record groundbreaking. 6,256 folks out there. I know Don was out. We set a Guinness record, um, and it was just an incredible day. Um, so we're really, really proud of our new stadium and what we're doing. I think it's going to mean a lot to the community and what we're doing here today. Um, so, you know, the Quakes are a great part of the community. I'm excited to bring Don Garber up to speak. He has a great history at MLS. Um, you know, I think Don is the most innovative commissioner in Major League Soccer and, and really in the country, and uh, I'm really proud to have him here today to speak. I think our, here's another one of the views of the stadium. I think Don uh, has really, you know, really done a lot, obviously, at MLS, um, and I'm really proud to have him here to speak for the conference. So, Don? Thank you, Dave. Well, thanks for having me here this morning. Uh, when I got a call from uh, Lou Wolf, who's uh, one of the owners of the Earthquakes, and said that uh, you folks were coming together and we're going to talk a little bit about technology and talk about sports and bring people together who really care about uh, our industry, I was really honored to, uh, to come out and speak with you. So I appreciate James and Greg and uh, giving me the invite and uh, for all of you for spending your morning with us to talk a little bit about sports and innovation and technology. And, I'm sure you get lots of speeches from people who kind of talk about uh, the basics of their business or their industry. And I thought I would do it a little bit differently. I'm not sure everybody here 
has a full understanding of Major League Soccer or the earthquakes or soccer in America. So I'll go through a little bit of that. But I thought I would turn it into something that I think would be a little more interesting for you, which is how uh, in a market that's known for innovation, for when we as people in the sports industry, I just or in American business, think of Silicon Valley, you think of great companies, you think of people taking risks, you think of big ideas and folks that are trying to transform industry and create different ways for uh, us to live our lives. Uh, these are some of the things that our founders were thinking about when uh, Major League Soccer was being formed. And I think you'll find it very interesting because it's not like the other leagues. Uh, we've not been around for the generations that the NFL and baseball and, uh, and hockey have been around. Uh, we're very new. Uh, Major League Soccer is only uh, 20 years old. And when our founders came together, uh, they had deep experience in primarily the National Football League. And they were uh, trying to find a way that they could create a different type of professional sports league that would capture some of the great opportunities that were taking place in our country. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but it goes back to the fact that there has been a lot of innovation in sports, though that innovation and technology really isn't as much about what takes place on the field. If you think about it, our games haven't changed much. The equipment hasn't changed much. The rules have barely changed at all. Uh, the innovation in technology has really happened in our facilities, and there's no better example of that than what's going on right down the block and certainly what's going to happen with the new earthquake uh, stadium. And certainly there's been a lot of innovation and technology uh, with how we interact with our fans. And I'm going to go into a little uh, detail with that. But if you go back 100 years or 50 years or even 20 years, a lot of the innovation has happened with our sport as it relates to how our industry has really transformed uh, the way we go about doing business and the way we go about trying to interact uh, and uh, affect society. So go all the way back to uh, Branch Rickey. Uh, this is a guy, uh, if you don't know who he is, who integrated baseball. He set the stage for that sport truly becoming America's game. And if any of you have seen the recent uh, movie, uh, 41 about Jackie Robinson, a great example of how those changes that Branch Rickey was thinking about really were a big part of how our country sort of exists today. Uh, as it relates to the National Football League, you'll be hearing from Dwight uh, later on today. Uh, Pete Rozelle was their first commissioner that really was uh, hitting the ground and trying to figure out how to make American football, the National Football League, a big time sport. Uh, he thought about national television at a time where national television was not engaged in sport, and today it's the most popular and powerful and valuable national sport in the world. Uh, and he came up with his idea of revenue sharing. So revenue sharing is something that uh, is a way for owners to uh, engage as partners, and you'll see how Major League Soccer has sort of taken that to a different level. That core aspect of revenue sharing was Pete's idea. It's what, in my opinion, has made the National Football League the most successful sport uh, in the world. And it's about uh, doing things that have owners being partners together. And Major League Soccer has really taken that to a new level, and I'll describe that. Uh, David Stern, who uh, has been the commissioner for the, the NBA for over 30 years, uh, and worked with the US Olympic Committee and the IOC to take a bunch of uh, basketball players that we all know now as the dream team to the Olympics in 1992 in Barcelona, and that experience exposed not, uh, uh, basketball and the NBA to a global audience, and now you could see guys like Chernobyl and Tony Parker playing for uh, the, uh, the, the great team in San Antonio, guys who are not American citizens, and their whole experience, if you speak to them, they'll tell you that they got turned on to the game in 1992 uh, when the NBA came and had that global platform. That was David Stern's idea. It's a great innovation. And then one that you might not think about is Billie Jean King. Uh, this is a, a woman who took multiple risks to stand up for equality and to grow women's sports through what she did on the court, but also through the Women's Tennis Association, the Women's Sports Foundation. And I think that was the beginning of providing uh, an opportunity for tens and tens of millions of female athletes to uh, really become productive members of our industry and then driving uh, politics through Title IX. I think if it wasn't for Billie Jean King and doing what she did, women's sports wouldn't, wouldn't be today. 
So ultimately, as I said before, while technology uh, is a big part of what happens off the field, it really hasn't been much of what's happened on the field. Uh, the innovation aspect of it, I'd like to take from a, a few minutes from an MLS perspective and talk about how our guys came together, a bunch of owners, and tried to come up with what I'll describe as a new idea for professional sports. Uh, our league was founded by Phil Anschutz, a guy that you might have heard of. He runs a company called the Anschutz Entertainment Group. Owns the Los Angeles Kings and part of the Lakers and lots and lots of other things. Uh, a guy named Robert Kraft, who's uh, arguably one of the more influential owners in the National Football League. Uh, and Lamar Hunt, who was one of the founders of uh, the NFL. The guy uh, came up with the idea for the Super Bowl. That was his idea when he was running the American Football League. Uh, Lamar Hunt called it the Super Bowl because his young son Clark, who's now the owner of the Chiefs and member of our executive committee, used to play with a, a ball called a Super Ball. You, know, you guys, if you're old enough, might remember those Super Balls. And uh, he, Lamar came into an owner's meeting and said, I think we should call our big championship game the Super Bowl. And here we are almost 50 years later with, uh, with the Super Bowl. Uh, but when these guys came together, they looked at what was going on in all of the other professional sports and said, we want to start a league that will be different, that could capitalize on all the opportunities going on in our country, but very, very importantly, have a structure that will allow us to deal with the challenges that the other major leagues were going through, labor challenges, issues where one team versus another, and you might know this living, being an Oakland A's fan, you have a couple of teams over in baseball that live uh, on, the, uh, on the East Coast that could decide to spend whatever it is that they want to spend on players. Very limited controls about that. So our league has a very, very uh, structured salary cap and salary budget. And that was a way for us to deal with some of the large market uh, issues and some of the parity issues that really can drive challenges in other leagues. Uh, that concept was structured as what we call a single entity. Major League Soccer is a company. It's actually a limited liability corporation. I'm the CEO of that company. All of the owners own an equal share in that company. They're shareholders in that company. And though I'm the commissioner and do all sorts of commissioner-like stuff, at the end of the day, I'm accountable to that board as a CEO, no different than many of you who are CEOs of your company. Each owner has a share that gives them the opportunity to operate a team. So the earthquakes have the right to operate their team within 70 miles of their stadium. Uh, they are partners with all of their other owners off the field, but obviously big competitors on the field. The public, the consumer, the fan, really has no idea that this structure exists. And it exists in a way so that this very small league and a league that's only 20 years old has the ability to have all their owners to come together and work with each other to frankly compete against some of the other leagues in time. And in our case, very importantly, compete against all the other international soccer leagues that are becoming more and more popular. Every player that plays in Major League Soccer, and we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them today, are all those contracts are all signed by the league. So while Dave and John Doyle, his general manager, will say to the league, I want to go sign this young man or I want to go sign that international player, the actual contract is negotiated by the league. That's something that's very, very unique in global sports. When the league was founded, the NFL Players Association came together and said, boy, if this happened in the NFL, this would be a really bad thing for us. And they organized a bunch of other players' unions that had nothing to do with Major League Soccer, and they brought a legal class action antitrust suit against Major League Soccer, saying that, hey, if, if something like this happens, if the owners can come together and they could negotiate in one way, no different than any other single company could negotiate with their employees, because those employees actually work for the league, uh, then that's a violation. It's a monopoly. It's a violation of antitrust. We had a very, very extensive law school, a lawsuit, and it lasted for almost 10 years, went up through the federal courts, went actually up to uh, uh, being potentially heard by the Supreme Court. And our story was soccer is a global market. If you want to play in the NFL, there are very few places for you to really play. You can play in Canada, but you're going to play in the NFL. So if those owners are going to negotiate collectively for player salaries, then they're colluding with each other. But in Major League Soccer, if we don't sign a young player in San Jose, he can work in any other country around the world. There are 280 soccer leagues in the world, and he can participate in a global market. 
And that case was heard amongst uh, a jury of peers, and we won that case. And it was a landmark antitrust case that basically said, soccer is a global game. There's a lot of what I'm going to talk about later today. Our players are participating in a global market. All of our employees are participating in a global market. It's part of what makes us different. So we're not a franchise system. We're actually operating as a single company. It's a very interesting uh, aspect of what makes us different, and it's certainly very uh, innovative. All of our revenues, national revenues, are shared equally. San Jose is a smaller market than New York. They get an equal share of our television revenue, an equal share of our sponsorship revenue. 30% of their ticket revenue goes into this budget that ends up paying all the player salaries. So there's even revenue sharing among uh, ticket uh, revenues. So in uh, Seattle, where we have 50,000 fans coming to every game, 30% of that revenue goes into the pot. Dave is going to sell out every game in his, his new 18,500 seat stadium. He shares 30% as well. So it's a very unique approach to partnership. Uh, one of the interesting things that's, uh, that happen is we get together regularly as a board and we look at how we're going to go about dealing with consumers. Uh, we go out and do extensive research on a regular basis. We have focus groups. We have fan councils. We have all sorts of things that we do to try to track the market. And then we take that information. We make changes to this system. And the changes to those systems can happen all we need is a supermajority of all of our owners to decide what it is that we want to do. So if we go out and we see that lots of people watching the Premier League on television. We go out and do some fan research and we say, why are those ratings go up, and are going up so high and why are Major League Soccer ratings not uh, going up at the same level? And the fans say it's because we want to see international stars. We want to see something that connects the league for, uh, with the international game. So we get together, we get our group together, we have our owners come together and we say, Let's figure out a way that we could attract guys like David Beckham and Terry Henry. And collectively, we change our rules and we say now every team can go out and sign three players that are outside that salary budget. They can spend whatever they want to spend on those three players. But we decide about that collectively, as opposed to New York or LA, who has more revenue, deciding that they do that and then giving San Jose a far more difficult playing field to be able to compete. So all of these kinds of rules are managed collectively based on research, no different than any other company that's sitting around this table is going to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we started this league with 10 teams in uh, 1996 at a time that came right after the 1994 World Cup. Everybody was all excited about the most successful World Cup that ever taken place in the world. It's still the most successful World Cup to ever uh, take place, bigger than Germany, certainly bigger than South Africa. It'll be bigger than Brazil. And uh, we were given a mandate by our global governing body to start this professional league. That's the group that Anschutz and Kraft and Hunt put together to get this unique plan. That, those 10 teams today are 19. So in 18 years, our league has expanded dramatically. Uh, we just recently announced a 20th team that will play in New York City. That team will be owned by the New York Yankees and by Manchester City, a Premier League team. Uh, when we originally raised money to start Major League Soccer, the original investment 18 years ago was $5 million. Manchester City and the Yankees paid $100 million for that 20th team, which will hit the ground in uh, 2015. They will play in a soccer-specific stadium that we're looking to build uh, in New York City. The budget for that stadium is $350 million. So if you think about nearly a half a billion dollars coming into Major League Soccer, 18 years after a founding where there was uh, nothing more than an idea and a plan. It's fairly, fairly remarkable growth uh, that's happened. The ownership group has expanded as dramatically. Here in San Jose, John Fisher and the Gap family and Lou Wolf uh, own our team. Our Portland team, which just hit a couple years ago and sells out every game and has got 10,000 people on a season ticket waiting list, is owned by former Treasury Secretary and uh, Goldman Sachs Chairman uh, Hank Paulson. Uh, we have uh, Paul Allen partnering with a very well-known Hollywood producer owning our Seattle team. Uh, the ownership group is really among the best ownership group in professional sports. It's also the most diverse ownership group. We have owners from Indonesia, from Mexico, from Austria, from England. That diversity reflects the diversity of our country and it gives us the ability to sit around our board table and have a, a very, very diverse and different and uh, and powerful, I think, um, debate about what we need to do to grow the sport. 
Uh, a couple of things on, in terms of fan uh, measures. Uh, start of the league, we were averaging about eight or 9,000 fans a game. Uh, last season, we averaged 19,000 fans a game. Uh, we're now the third highest attended uh, aver on an average basis sport in America after the NFL and Major League Baseball. That's something that most people probably don't know. Obviously, fewer games than the, uh, the NBA and the NHL play, but think about how far this sport has come when you have almost 20,000 fans a game attending uh, a soccer match. Uh, in terms of fan uh, research, uh, ESPN just did a poll. Uh, very, very interesting story for us. Among young people, young people, that Gen Y community, uh, professional soccer is their second favorite sport after the NFL. So young people are very, very engaged in this game. Gives us enormous opportunity to tap into this Gen Y audience. I'll talk about how we're doing that from a, a digital perspective. That's research that came to us kind of over the transom. We were very surprised to see that young people were really that engaged uh, in our sport. It's obviously a story that uh, we uh, are going to build uh, far more deeply on in the years to come. Something that I, uh, I thought I would uh, uh, kind of give you some detail on in terms of why we think soccer is a great investment, why it's grown uh, so much over the last uh, near two decades. There are three things really that have driven our growth. The first is, you can just see it in the, uh, the character uh, complexion in this room, the, the demographic shift that's going on in our country is dramatic. Uh, the Hispanic population today totals almost 52 million people. Uh, this is a community that loves the game, does not need to be convinced that soccer is a great sport. When you think about all of the stories and all of the politics and all the things that are going on with immigration in our country, this is a population that is very, very core to our business, something that gives us a point of difference over any other sport. More Hispanics follow Major League Soccer than any of the other major leagues. It's by far the most popular sport among this community. Uh, that's number one in terms of what's driving our growth. The second is globalization, globalization something I think everybody in this market's well aware of. When you think about uh, the fact that somebody could watch a Premier League game or an Italian League game or a Spanish League game as easily as they can watch an NFL game on television, soccer is coming into our shores, creating some competitive challenges, but at the same time, it's creating a very, very broad market of soccer fans. Somebody who lives in Brooklyn, New York, probably has as much in common with a relative that lives in Moscow as they might with a neighbor who lives in Staten Island. So this shrinking global community has brought soccer to our shores, and all of a sudden, it's not considered a foreign sport. So globalization has been a very, very big part of driving this growth. And last is uh, this development of what I describe as a soccer culture. For the last 20 years, there's been almost 18, 19, 20 million people that have been playing the game, young people playing the game, young boys and girls. Today, near generational shift, 20 years, so there's been a generational turn. All of those young people now have grown up. They're consumers, they're influencers, they're making decisions, they're politicians, they're sitting in the White House. Uh, with two young daughters who play the game, and that power has been driven by all of those kids who play. So when people say to us, why aren't there 50,000 people going to MLS games? There are so many kids that play. It's not necessarily about young people being fans. It's about young people growing up and growing up with soccer a part of their lives. And with soccer a part of their lives, they're going to be great, great uh, targets for us uh, to influence the growth of our game. So. These young, what we call Gen Yers, are a big driver of the core of our audience. You saw in that video, they're waving flags. The folks that are sitting uh, in, uh, in Dave Stadium now, if you've ever gone to an earthquake game, it's a hot, vibrant environment that you're not going to see in many other professional sp uh, sports matches. It's giving them an opportunity to really, really engage in participating in sport very differently than they might be able to participate in other sports. So it's a big part of what's really happening in our league. So just a couple of things that, uh, that we, I thought would be of interest to you is uh, uh, technology, as I said, is really not happening on the field for us. Uh, our game is played the same way it's been played for 100 years. Uh, frankly, our governing body is not all that interested in using technology. FIFA is a governing body in ways that if it were up to me, if I were king, uh, we would use. Uh, I think our rules need to change a bit. Uh, they haven't changed much in the last 50 years. We don't have instant replay. We don't have a lot of the things that I, I personally think could help enhance 
uh, some of the experiences uh, that, uh, that people have in interacting with the game. Where technology has been important for us is what we're doing in our stadiums and what we're doing uh, with our fans. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, some of the digital things that we do. We've got a very ap active digital uh, team in Major League Soccer. It's the biggest part of our organization, believe it or not. Of the 200 people that work in the league office, 80 of them work in our digital group. Uh, creating apps, working on digital content, working on our website, MLSsoccer.com, working on a joint venture we have with Kugel called Kick TV, which is one of the more popular uh, sports online you, uh, Google YouTube channels. Not just doing Major League Soccer, but uh, doing a wide variety of other programs. All of these digital applications are things that we're working on to try to engage with that consumer that's interacting, as I just tweeted, even though I was standing here, my friend back there tweeted for me, uh, working on understanding social media, working on understanding how our fans are engaging uh, with their products, engaging with their players, engaging with their teams. I would say that when we wake up every day, uh, we're thinking first and foremost, how can we use these unique technologies to get closer to the consumer who's using those same technologies uh, to engage with things that they love? So MLS, being the youngest pro sports league, is, uh, has an average age of uh, 28 years old in our league office. So people are young, people are hip, people are very connected uh, through technology. Uh, what we're doing in our stadiums is, uh, is also very unique. Uh, when Major League Soccer was founded many, many years ago, the idea was for us to uh, have our owners have counter-seasonal programming uh, for their NFL and college stadiums. So the Columbus crew played in a 100,000-seat stadium at Ohio State. Uh, the New York Metro Stars played in a 80,000-seat stadium uh, in, uh, in New York, what was uh, now called MetLife Stadium. Uh, we realized very quickly that that was not a good idea, uh, that our players, our fans, consumers generally want to be connected closely to what's happening on the field. They want to view that their teams have their own home. They don't want to believe that they're a tenant, that they don't have the control of their schedule and all the other things, just from a product perspective, that really matter. So in 1999, three years after the league was founded, Lamar Hunt built the first stadium, the Columbus Crew Stadium in Ohio. That stadium budget was $30 million. As I mentioned, the New York Stadium uh, 20 years later will be $350 million. Today we have 14 of those soccer-specific stadiums. We'll soon next year have a 15th uh, stadium here in San Jose, uh, providing us with the economic opportunity of being able to capture all sorts of ancillary revenues. This is a business uh, conference here. It allows us to uh, sell commercial rights. It allows us to have luxury product to be able to sell to those who are willing to pay for it. Allows us to capture concession revenue. It allows us to control our own, st uh, our own schedule. Things that really matter that if you can't do, you will not succeed. If Major League Soccer did not get on this track of spending billions and billions of dollars in developing soccer-specific sp uh, stadiums, Major League Soccer would have gone out of business. This is a picture of the uh, now StubHub Center. I was just at their new naming rights announcement yesterday, formerly the Home Depot Center in Los Angeles. Wednesday night game, a game that was aired on the new Time Warner Sports Network, and that was a, a sellout, 25,000 people attending uh, that game last night. That's a facility that's uh, on the uh, campus of UCAL uh, Dominguez Hills. Uh, that's a tennis stadium that's right adjacent to that. Uh, that uh, StubHub uh, sponsorship is one of the larger sponsorships in naming rights in pro sports, so it even shows that these soccer stadiums that have many, many events, not just soccer games, but all sorts of ancillary events, are driving great commercial value for uh, our partners. A couple of other things that I moved from stadium that I think speak to, speak to innovation, speak to business, and uh, speak to trying to find some ideas outside the box. One thing we realized when we did our research early on was that the size of the soccer market in the United States was growing faster than the MLS market. So there were more people that were getting engaged in the game, and that market was growing faster than the market for MLS fans. So in about 2001 and 2002, we said to our owners, we still believe we should have a slow growth plan uh, for Major League Soccer. We shouldn't go and take a three or four million dollar salary budget and make it 20 million dollars or 50 million dollars. We should grow carefully, but we think we should create a new company to go out and capture that opportunity that's existing in this market. Now 50, 60, 70 million overall soccer fans in America. 
So we created a company called Soccer United Marketing. That's a company that's similar to NFL properties or NBA Entertainment or NHL Enterprises. But the big difference is that this company is not just uh, developing opportunity for MLS, but is also representing non-MLS related soccer content and trying to roll up soccer opportunities in this market and take that uh, value and deliver that value back to our owners through a dividend. So that company in 2002 did something very bold. We went out and we bought the English language World Cup rights for the United States from FIFA. We were bidding against others. We were bidding against broadcasters for those rights. And in 2001, we spent $40 million. Seems like, seemed like a lot of money for us uh, then. It's not a lot of money today. And we were the owner of the World Cup rights in the US. And we took those rights with Major League Soccer broadcast rights, English language, and then we packaged them with ABC and ESPN. At that time, MLS really wasn't able to stand on its own to get the right kind of television rights deal from uh, our broadcast partners. And uh, we were the owner. By the way, today, in uh, 2007, when we no longer own those rights, we got ABC, ESPN, Fox at that time, now NBC and Univision and RDS and TSN in Canada. Those broadcasters, five of them now pay us rights fees and produce uh, their programming for us. So five years after we had to make that investment to try to prove to the market that MLS would be a good property, five years later those same broadcasters paid us for those rights without us having to go at risk in buying the World Cup rights. Today, Sark United Marketing represents the rights for the U.S. Soccer Federation. So when you see a World Cup qualifying match from our stadium in Salt Lake, Rio Tinto Stadium, just the other night where the U.S. beat Honduras, uh, that game is marketed and promoted and sold by Major League Soccer. When you see a Mexican national team game here in this market or a huge sellout we had in Houston just the other night with almost 70,000 people going to game, Soccer United Marketing owns that game, sells the sponsorship, sells the tickets, and packages it for television. And all of those opportunities deliver a dividend back to our owners, and that dividend is used to help grow Major League Soccer. A couple of years ago, we were approached by a private equity firm, a company called Providence Equity. Providence is one of the leading um, media sports uh, uh, private equity banks in the world, and they approached us and said, hey, we're really intrigued by what you guys are doing at Soccer United Marketing, and we sold 25% of that company to a PE firm. So very different. I don't think you're going to see the NFL or the NBA a selling a piece of their business uh, to a private equity firm, but for us, it was an opportunity to really expand our global reach for that company, to get a massive infusion of capital, to use that capital to grow our business in ways that we did not have to fund on our own. So again, another example of something that's very different, very unique, uh, and, and something that we're, we're very, very proud of. Uh, just a couple of things as I, uh, as I continue to go on here. Uh, we very much believe that the opportunity is vast for the sport in this country. Uh, we are very long on what we think uh, the sport can be. Uh, that long is driven by all those market changes and demographic shifts that I've also been talking about, but it's also driven by the rise of the American and now Canadian player that's becoming far better, far more successful on the global stage. And that's uh, motivating us to do something, again, that I think you'll find unique and different in professional sports. We've mandated, part of the single entity thing, we have the right to come together and mandate things to our clubs. We mandated that they have to go out and start youth academies. So each and every one of our MLS clubs has to have a team at the U18 level, at the U17 level, all the way down to U14. These academies will play with the San Jose uh, say Earthquake kit, their, their logo and their club design, but more importantly, those players that are developed in their, their academies are owned by that particular club. Something that is very unique in our sport and something that almost it would be shocking to sports fans who don't understand it, when you sign a contract with a soccer player, that contract is owned by that person who owns that contract. And when that player wants to leave Major League Soccer and go play in England, for example, Major League Soccer sells that right to the team that wants that player. So Josie Altidore, who so scored a great goal the other night for the United States, was a young kid who was developed in our academy in New York. 
uh, for the New York Red Bulls. He was 19 years old. He was playing as a kid in that academy. He played for a couple of years for the Red Bulls, and they sold him to a Spanish club for $10 million. There's a player that's playing for Tottenham in the Premier League now. He's 21 years old, and he's on the global market now. Tottenham is looking for $135 million for that player who is looking to play at Real Madrid. So think about that right. So it's a very, very valuable opportunity. So all those players that Dave uh, develops, he can put them onto his first team without that player going into the draft. And if that player decides in a couple of years that he wants to go play someplace else, that right is sold and that capital is kept by the club, though a portion of it is shared with all the league partners. Uh, a very, very interesting analogy here is if that existed in the NBA, Kobe Bryant's from Philly, the Philadelphia 76ers had that academy structure. Kobe wouldn't be playing for the Lakers. Kobe would be playing for the Sixers, and maybe more people would be following the <laughs> Philadelphia 76ers as opposed to the Lakers. So it's a very, very unique approach, and, and one that we um, are very, very proud of. Uh, just a couple of thoughts on stadium technology uh, before I wrap up here. Uh, the San Jose Stadium is one that uh, is not just going to be filled with all sorts of really cool things, but but has a massive economic uh, uh, impact in this market. And I think, again, it's a business conference. I thought you'd find it interesting. So there'll be 14,000 jobs for that stadium. Small stadium, less than 20,000 people, but 14,000 people will be working on that project. Uh, it'll include a one and a half million square feet of office space, a 300-room hotel, community soccer fields, and almost 100,000 square feet of retail. Uh, the economic impact on the construction in this market will be almost $2 billion. MLS team, MLS stadium impacting this market by almost $2 billion. The ongoing economic impact will be $62 million a year. Now, far dwarfed by the economic impact of the big stadium right across the street, but something that is really remarkable when you think about how young this league is and how far that it's come. Uh, and just in terms of revenue for uh, the city's general fund, it'll put two million bucks in the city's general revenue pocket, uh, something that I think is in, important and valuable for uh, the people here in this market. Uh, in Kansas City, when we have built a, a very, very cool, very, very technology-oriented uh, stadium, uh, we, we have a, a, a facility that's not just delivering value and impact for the community, but is doing some ways that I think shorter of perhaps what's happening across the street and uh, maybe what's happening in the new Dallas Stadium probably is the most high-tech stadium in the world. It's a stadium of about 18,000 uh, people. It's built in an area right near the NASCAR track. Very cool story how that stadium was built. It's owned by uh, two folks that are the founders of a company called the Cerner Corporation. It's one of the uh, world's leading uh, medical biotech firms. Uh, they were looking to shop their uh, world headquarters and find a place to house their 6,000 jobs. And uh, they bought the Kansas City uh, team from who was uh, Lamar Hunt at that time, and they said, that city which gives me $200 million for my soccer stadium gets my 6,000 jobs. And uh, the city of Kansas City provided $200 million in funding for that stadium. So a great relationship with the community and an absolutely fantastic stadium. They used a good amount of that money uh, to put HD Wi-Fi uh, in that stadium. It's one of the few stadiums which are actually Wi-Fi uh, capable. So if you go in a lot of NFL stadiums today, you can't go online. There's just too many people, and they don't have the capacity. Uh, they, you can download 120-minute HD video in four seconds in that stadium. Now, this is where the Google, uh, uh, the new Google, uh, what, what are we calling it, Dave? The Google Web Center in Kansas City? The Google Fiber uh, test is going to be in Kansas City, so they've got obviously a very close relationship with Google in that community. There are QR codes on every seat, so fans come in, they take their smartphone, they check in and reveal their location, not just for cool things like Foursquare, but also for letting those people in the stadium know that they're there because they've got an account set up with concessions and the like, and if they know they're there, they've got their menu preferences, they've got all the other things that they like, and that QR code is the first way that uh, that, that happens. There's a data moder database monitoring system. It shows who's online for how long, and what they are doing. Interesting uh, with all the news going on today, so that uh, Sporting Kansas City can track 
what their fans are doing. Are they going on Twitter? Are they going on their website? Are they going on e Watch ESPN Live? Are they going on the MLS app, giving us a whole lot of information? They have their own sporting Kansas City Explorer app, earning points, all the things that I'm sure you're familiar with. Go on the app, do certain things, check in, get points, be part of a membership. When you move up the rank, you get all sorts of cool stuff. Ad targeting, working with Cisco on a new platform that they put together, enables them to use uh, 40, 400 stadium vision screens that they have to target ads at a specific location. So when people check in, they know who they are, they know their preferences, they know who, how old they are, they have a hub in their ad server, and certain ads are being delivered and certain screen, screens based on what people are tracking in and throughout the stadium. Totally unique and very cool. And obviously, and I think you'll see this in uh, the new stadium here, I know they have it in MetLife, there's a whole area of social media, uh, social media hub, so they're aggregating conversation, those, that aggravated conversation is shot up to their video board so that people are watching highlights, but they're also tracking what people are saying about the game. Very, very cool stuff. And, and, and something that I think when you have a small stadium uh, is very, very manageable. Uh, so I, I thought that, uh, uh, and I don't know that we have, Dan was still showing Kansas City pictures. No, we've left. Uh, one last thing on, uh, on, on this that, that gives us something that uh, I think is very important. There are 400 cameras that are around that stadium, very small cameras that allow us from a security perspective to be able to see what's going on in the stadium. Uh, we are able, not for reasons that are inappropriate, but able if somebody is throwing something on the field. And we had a situation where a water bottle was thrown, hit a goalkeeper in the head during the game. And it was in a huge crowded fan section. We were able to pinpoint that person by his face, face recognition, so that that guy then is contacted. We know who he is because he's checked in. We can go to that person and talk to him. We can tell him he can't come into the stadium for three, week three weeks for a month. But that concept is something that is enormously important for all of us in the sports business that are hoping to keep our stadiums uh, as uh, safe and secure as we possibly can. Uh, lastly, on our own uh, stuff that we're doing in Major League Soccer. I mentioned Kick TV. I mentioned our app, Match Day Live. We stream every game on that app. You can download it on your smartphone. Very cool. It's, uh, it's one that Apple worked with us uh, to help develop. We were working with a developer that we thought was uh, really cool, and Apple came to us and said, you know what, we really think that you should work with this group. And uh, we were kind of wondering what that was all about, and a bunch of guys came out, and they were huge soccer fans. The guys from Apple are huge soccer fans, and they helped us to develop this app. You can go on that app uh, and you could watch a game, you could watch highlights, they're streamed in HD, you could share in social conversation and community. There are just so many things that are going on with that and we're investing deeply in it. Uh, just uh, two days ago we uh, announced a, uh, an initiative that we're calling MLS Plus. This is something we've done through the funding that uh, came through us in our new relationship with Providence. So we're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars to go tell the stories about Major League Soccer and our players to create, if you will, our own digital version of NFL films. We've hired a guy that, uh, his name is Jonathan Hock. He's probably most famous for producing probably 20% of all the ESPN 30 for 30 sports documentaries. And we're going to produce all this programming and package it cross-platform so that uh, this highlight show, MLS Plus, will, MLS Insider, will premiere on NBC, but all of the pods will be taken out of that show, and we're going to take that across all sorts of global platforms, not just on our own uh, platforms, but we're going to share all of that information through our fans and through other cross-multi-platform relationships that we're going to have throughout the world. So if you were going to think about the analogy here, if you were going to watch This Week in the NFL, Likely you're going to see that on who's ever airing that show, but you're not going to see one of those pieces taken out and exposed on a multi-platform basis. That's what we're trying to do in a very, very different way uh, with MLS Plus, That's why we're calling it MLS Plus, uh, in a way that we hope will engage uh, with our fans and telling the story behind the game. So I think I've, uh, I've used my whole 20-minute allocation. I appreciate the opportunity of, uh, of talking to you a little bit about soccer, a little bit about Major League Soccer, about technology and innovation. I hope that you will leave with doing one of two things today. A, uh, 
by a sponsorship from Dave Cavill and his sponsorship group. But if you can't do that, sit down with these guys and take in a game. This weekend, there will be 50,000 people who will come to see the Earthquakes play, and I'm sure you think and hope beat the LA Galaxy in Stamford. Uh, it's going to be a great event, uh, great television property, but also something that I hope you get a chance uh, to experience live and in person. Thank you very much. Silicon Valley Business Journal. And again, can we just give a hand to the commissioner? That Thank was you. Uh, News Corp President Peter Chernin once told me, my, my job is to get in the way of money. And everything you were saying about soccer sounds like, as a CEO, you have positioned the league to do that between the demographic changes that are happening and everything. So what a fantastic opportunity. Um, you're no stranger to Silicon Valley. Uh, this year, you gave your State of the League address at the Googleplex on a G, uh, Google Plus chat. Uh, what did you see about the people at Google that makes you think Silicon Valley is such an important market to MLS? Well, you know, it starts with, uh, you know, we, we have to be different. We have to take risks. Uh, we have to do things that uh, are going to break through uh, some of the clutter that happens. And I think we um, have to accept the fact that soccer is an emerging business and, and one that's still got its best years ahead. Uh, and when we met the Google folks, frankly, through uh, what we were doing with their uh, YouTube initiative, uh, our PR folks, Dan Cordomantri's in the back, said, you know, let's, let's do something different with our state of the league. We've done this the same way for my 14 years. You sit in a conference room with a big speaker and there's hundreds of people that are uh, anonymously behind you asking questions. It's boring. I kind of, I'm on my Blackberry or my, now my iPhone during those uh, State of the League teleconferences. We said, let's do this uh, a bit better. Uh, the Google folks came in and, and believed that uh, there was an opportunity to speak to uh, their social community, uh, that our media folks would engage with it. It was a little hard for them. You know, you're looking at a screen and there are about 50 media people that are there uh, uh, live in video. Um, technology worked well. I don't think it was perfect, uh, but we really, uh, we really enjoyed it. Uh, I think you'll see more and more people do that. I think I've got another thing coming up. I think I'm doing a Reddit chat coming up pretty soon. Uh, you know, we, we, we've got to engage in this new uh, medium, if you will. Right. Um, so the Earthquake Stadium and the development that's going to be around it are generating some eye-popping numbers that you talked about. Um, so that is a privately financed project with Lou Wolf and Mr. Fisher. Can you uh, talk about the advantages for the MLS and that kind of development model and, and how common that is? Well, love to have public finance, right? So uh, in the world that we, <laughs> we live in, uh, we accept the fact that the world is changing, our economy is changing, uh, leverage changes, Greg. So I think it depends on what deal you have. Certainly in Kansas City, there was a lot of leverage. Uh, markets are different. The, the, uh, the, the personal connection that consumers have with, uh, with sports have changed and therefore the appetite that they have for tax dollars to uh, fund these things continues to evolve. Uh, in this particular uh, situation, this was a unique deal as you know, the, the elephant in the room is we tried to do this uh, eight or nine years ago. And we were not able to do that and move this team. And the San Jose earthquakes are the most traumatic thing that I've ever done as commissioner moved uh, to Houston. And then we realized with the political folks here and the powers that be that there was a market. We were able to come back with Lou and John. And here we are. Uh, that team will hit the ground uh, with a new stadium in 2014. We moved into 2006. So these things take time. The development in and around it, I think, will drive some of the economics. Uh, I think it'll be great for the community. I think it'll be great for all the partners. Uh, I think this is an absolutely fantastic sports region. Passionate fans for all of their sports teams. I think it'll be wildly successful. I was going to follow up on that and, and ask you, you know, what, a, what is it about this market that makes it such an attractive uh, uh, place to, to have a team? You know, obviously with the Niners Stadium and with Dave Stadium. Uh, and the possibility that Lou wants to move the athletics down. Right. So, well, I, th I, I think it's a really good question. I'll, from a soccer perspective, the Bay Area is just a very passionate soccer region. Lots of people who play. The Earthquakes have done. A, who did a great job in the early days to create uh, a fan following. Uh, there's just a, an, a level of interest and support for the sport that I think puts it in the top regions uh, in North America. So, from a soccer perspective, 
it starts with, uh, it starts with that. I think participation in that story of those participants growing uh, off of the back of the fact that people said, how many people have gone to NASL games years ago? Almost everybody raised their hand. So all the dots are connected as it relates to our sport. You look at the region, lots of corporations. Corporations are necessary to drive good economics for uh, pro sports. Lots of passionate fans. I think it's one of the best sports markets in the country for all sports. The success of the building across the street has gotten everybody in our industry really excited. Over a billion dollars of what we call con contractually obligated income has been generated for that building. And, and Jed and, and his family, it's just absolutely remarkable. What an unbelievable story. I hope Lou is, you know, he's my buddy. I hope he can get his uh, baseball stadium uh, situated. I just read about uh, the news with uh, the city uh, taking uh, Major League Baseball to task. Uh, we'll all be watching that uh, very closely. Yeah, you're, uh, I, probably everyone in the room is, is rooting for Lou on that. Uh, can you talk a little bit about his influence on soccer? Sure. So uh, we met Lou uh, when we were going through that process, the, uh, the trauma of moving. And uh, Lou called me up uh, a week after we uh, literally had the press announcement saying we're moving the team, said, hi, I'm Lou Wolf. You may or may not know me, but I think I can get a stadium done here. As you know, Lou's a big developer. He and his family for, for years and years in this market. Would you come out and meet with me? I've got a partner I'd like you to meet in John, and uh, we got to bring soccer back. And the deal to bring it back came together very, very quickly. He's 70-plus uh, he's years young. Uh, I get emails from Lou at all hours of the night. <laughs> Incredible passion, <laughs> terrific man. I think mean, Greg, uh, Keith, his son, is unbelievably smart and is really a uh, chip off the old block. It's a, it's a fantastic ownership group. And, you know, interestingly, we don't talk, talk a lot about the game. This is a club that last year was, without doubt, the most exciting team in Major League Soccer. They were the team with the best record. That's, I've gone to a lot of games uh, in the small stadium. It's fun. It's, there's an energy. There's almost a thickness to the passion that exists uh, in that stadium. It's uh, something we're very, very pleased and proud of. I talked to a couple folks before uh, the presentation started today, and, and they said, you know, just diehard fans. For those who, who aren't perhaps earthquake fans, how, and, and I know that a parent is never supposed to favor a child, but how would you characterize the earthquakes? What's their, you know, soul? Well, I think it starts with their supporter group. Uh, when you go into that stadium, uh, there are, you know, it used to be that, that, and this is a cute story, I used to be, I could walk around any stadium because there are not that many people in the stands. So you could walk around, nobody knew who I was, and you can sort of have a pretty easy go at it. I can't walk around that stadium uh, because the fans in that, uh, the, the ultras are so passionate. Uh, there's so much uh, energy and there's so much sort of drama in that uh, side that if I want to go to the restroom, I got to go on the other end because I walk <laughs> there, people are going to uh, throw something at me. So uh, I, I think it, it starts with uh, there's a great passion uh, with their fans. There's also a great history with this club. It was why it was so traumatic to move. Uh, there's a core history to it that goes back to the Johnny Moore days, and it goes back to uh, the history of the team that was so embedded in the community. And that, 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 uh, that history combined with all those young, passionate fans, I think, gives it a specialness that, uh, that I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, at all of our events, I always try to ask one question that I think will generate something that, uh, you know, perhaps a, a business owner could take home as an opportunity to pursue to, to improve their uh, revenue picture. Can you talk a little bit about the business opportunities that spring up around stadiums and what some of the kind of hottest opportunities are that you see repeated in different markets? Well, it's clearly development and, and it's the opportunity to almost business crowdsource. You know, when you have uh, something that goes in in a parking lot, things get developed around it people come in, those people are consumers, those consumers are interested in engaging uh, with uh, those that are in and around that experience. So from a stadium development perspective, putting aside all the processes of getting it done, all the construction, all the marketing, all the sales, all the opportunities on the development side, once that stadium's there, they've come, and our experience become economic engines of opportunity. And for the league and for our clubs, the way we will get more of these built and the way we'll get more public support for them is to prove that theory. 
that when that stadium comes in, came in, the tax base was X, and now the tax base is Y. There was X amount of money going in the general fund. When the stadium is up and operated, there's now X plus two or X plus five. So all of the businesses that are, that are around it and those business opportunities around it are really for people here in this room uh, where the opportunity lies. And so do you have kind of a, uh, you know, your, your case study in that tax revenue going up, you know, the market that, that's generated uh, demonstrable business It would have to be an interesting, uh, it would have to be Seattle. And Seattle, we didn't build a stadium. And that's an outlier. I think every business should look at the, the outliers that they have and not think that that's the norm. Seattle's an incredible outlier for us. 45,000 season tickets and generating more. At a, a meeting, the owner of the team was with me last night. There are more people going into Century League f uh, Field to attend Sounders games than are attending Seahawks games. Now, we have more games than wow. they do, but the total audience is larger there than it is uh, for the Seahawks. So when you think of that, the size of that market, we had a soccer game that we promoted with U.S. Soccer last week. There were 3,500 people in the Mariner game that was taking place that night. There were 45,000 <laughs> in the soccer uh, stadium right next door. So the economic opportunity that's coming with that, that's obviously massive, Greg. Great. Well, thank you thank very you. much, Don. Appreciate it. Applause to Commissioner Garber. Yeah, that's great. Thank, thank you. you.